documents reveal that top scientists misled Congress about COVID origins. A top advisor to Dr. Anthony Fauci still thought a lab leak was possible in April of 2020, one month after claiming publicly that it wasn't. This is according to a new report by author Michael Schellenberger. Author of the public Substack, Michael Schellenberger is here with us today to discuss. Welcome, Michael. Good to be with you. So how do we know what this new timeline is? Tell us about this new document. Well, so as you may be aware, uh, last week, uh, two of the top scientists who've been studying COVID origins testified before Congress, and they were pressed on why they why we had people had discovered internal communications by them showing that they still thought the lab leak was possible and yet published a very well-known article in Nature Medicine uh, arguing that the lab leak uh, was not possible or was basically so improbable as to be not worth considering. We now have the complete record of the emails and internal Slack messages between these scientists during the period in which they were writing that article. I think the most stunning thing about it, so it's first of all, this is um, dozens of new messages uh, that have not been seen before. Uh, we have the exclusive on it. Uh, Matt Taibbi at Racket is doing a story as well on this. But what they show, I think the most dramatic thing is that they did not think that the the zoonotic spillover from bats to pangolins to humans, they did not think that they had proven that in their private correspondence. And yet when you read the Nature Medicine article, it suggests a high degree of confidence in that spillover. So I think it's pretty damning. We ran with a headline that says that they misled Congress. I think that's accurate and fair. It's tough. And what we're arguing here is pretty strong, but we think that the evidence supports it. Right. I'm looking at uh, these documents, these Slack messages um, in your uh, new piece, which just came out seconds before we uh, we had you on uh, to to discuss all this. And uh, yeah, it looks like, you know, this is after <laughs> Proximal Origins. And Christian Anderson is saying things like, are we absolutely certain that no culture could have been involved? And I, t I take that to mean he's discussing the, the lab uh, lab leak potential. He references um, comments that um, that she, the, you know, the quote unquote bat lady had recently made about having to check to see if it was a lab, the furin uh, site being messed with. That Again, this is after, correct me if I'm wrong, this part specifically is after Proximal Origins is already released. So it sounds like they put that out there. And, and of course, we know, you know that Fauci helped on some of the messaging, kind of pushing toward a, can you make stronger claims? You know, can it, can it be even stronger than this? And they still seem uncertain afterward. Yeah, that's right. There's, so first of all, there's a lot to unpack in this article. So I'm glad to take the time on it. I think it's worth pointing out a couple of things. Um, the first is that uh, indeed, long after they had published this Proximal Origins piece, which came out in preprint on February 16th, it was officially published March 16th, but all the way into mid-April, uh, Anderson, uh, the main author, was saying that he thought the lab leak was still very likely. I think the other thing I want to highlight in this is that we have more insight into this discussion of the higher-ups, meaning that they were feeling pressure from the higher-ups. One of the questions has been what happened in early February for Anderson and the other authors to change their minds so dramatically? Well, one clue is that there was a meeting organized by Anthony Fauci at the National Academies of Science, Engineering and Medicine, which, of course, is our preeminent scientific advisory organization created in 1863 to advise Congress in a non-political way. That meeting appears to have been very important. FBI was there, Office of Director of National Intelligence was there. Um, that appears to have occurred on February 3rd. By the time you get to February 5th, you see Anderson and the other scientists saying, oh, well, uh, we're really pursuing uh, this uh, natural spillover hypothesis. And I, we think that really this very dramatic moment occurs uh, that stood out to all of us when we were reading through the, the messages where Anderson literally changes the name of the Slack message group from Wuhan Engineering to Wuhan Pangolin, which is this intermediary animal that they're pointing to as, as being the intermediary between bats and humans. But then they go on and say that they don't think that they have the evidence that it came from, that it went through pangolins. And they're saying this very openly in the messages 
Meanwhile, the, the proximal origins paper really clearly fingers the pangolins. So when you reference pressure from the higher ups, do you have a sense of who that was and what form that took? I mean, we think that this the big revelation here is this National Academies of Sciences meeting that was organized by Fauci. But there's also um, evidence pointing to the influence of Jeremy Farrar, who was the head of Wellcome Trust, which is the very powerful health and medical research organization in Britain that was also involved in this. So it's the usual suspects in the sense it was Fauci, it was Francis Collins, the head of NIH, Jeremy Farrar in Britain. Um, but we also see at that meeting, FBI and ODNI, I would say I think there's some pretty important questions here because of course, people may remember that FBI director recently testified that FBI had long thought this was a lab leak. And so one of the things is what happened at that February 3rd meeting, there should be a Zoom recording of it and we have uh, told people in Congress, urged people in Congress that it'd be very important to find that Zoom recording and figure out what happened at that meeting. But I do think just with the documents that we've released today, it's very clear that the private understanding and consensus among these scientists, the five authors of this proximal origins paper was very different from what they told Congress. They told Congress, we were just engaging in science uh, clearly, they were engaging in rhetoric. We have another case in this article which shows them uh, misdirecting Don McNeil, the former New York Times reporter, who was one of the first to suspect that the virus may have come from a lab. So you're seeing a lot of rhetoric, a lot of machinations. There's even discussions. Anderson says, well, we should use Slack with the clear implication that if they use Slack, somehow it's not going to be subject to congressional subpoena or Freedom of Information Act requests. That's very similar to what a different Fauci aide had said about wanting to use his Gmail to similarly evade public scrutiny. So these are not what you would typically call scientific behaviors. These are behaviors by people seeking to deliver a particular outcome to their higher ups in a way that was secretive and deceptive. Hmm. Was there an eventual change of that Slack group to Wuhan Project Raccoon Dog, I guess. <laughs> we'll have to be waiting to find out if we got to that point. Uh, Michael Schellenberger, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me.